Hi again, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to do a broad introduction to the CNS, but then spend the majority of the time focusing on the protection systems of those delicate tissues of the central nervous system. All right, so here we go. Just like last time, you'll want to take a minute and print this worksheet off or get this worksheet from your instructor, and we will fill this in as we go. Um, today, I'll do a couple illustrations, which you'll just want to kind of uh, follow along with, do your best version of that illustration, um, and I gave you some space on that worksheet to do so. And your science comic for today. So this is an old phrenology diagram. They used to have this kind of pseudoscience where they'd measure different bumps on your skull and they'd associate them to different traits of that person. So this has obviously been disproven, but uh, if it were to be true, mine would focus mostly on uh, these areas here. If you're looking to get to know me a little better, obviously some insecurities as well. Following a really brief, broad introduction to the CNS, your lecture objectives for today are going to include exploring the types of protection that exists for the central nervous system. So these are going to include the meninges, just some protective layers, the ventricles, which allow the brain to kind of float atop this cushion, the cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, it's the fluid that provides that flotation, and then the blood-brain barrier, a selective barrier you've probably heard about before in relation to maybe some pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then we'll finish up with just a broad overview of spinal cord anatomy. So to start us off, I want you to think about what's the difference between me, a very amateur skier, get out a couple times a year, and a professional slalom skier? Or maybe a better example would be, what's the difference between you and Mozart? Well, the difference lies within these neural connections in the brain that are formed during critical development periods, as well as genetic components as well. Um, the difference between individuals' nervous systems are going to be due to varying environmental inputs. So depending on that external stimuli and the frequency that neural pathways are used, very different people with varying talents can arise. To begin, let's look at some of the components of the CNS on an actual cadaver. Your central nervous system is pretty much comprised of your brain and your spinal cord. So the brain can be broken down into a few different regions. This highly folded area up here is called the cerebrum, while this central core right here is called the diencephalon. Then we have this here called the brainstem with this really interesting cerebellum right behind it. But this brainstem is going to connect, you can see that we've cut it here, with the spinal cord. And that spinal cord is going to descend all the way down your back until it ends in that lumbar region. But essentially, if you're talking about the CNS or central nervous system, you're talking about your brain and your spinal cord. Following that short video, I want to give you a little more in-depth view of the organization of the central nervous system here. So we have two different views. At the top, we have an external view. Beneath that, we have an internal view or a sagittal view where we've cut across the midline here. So let's start with the spinal cord. So spinal cord um, runs through the foramen of the vertebrae for some protection. And above that, we have the brain stem. And the brainstem, you can see, is made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla, while the midbrain we can only see on that internal cross-section there of the brain. Following that, we have the cerebellum at the back of the brain, and then the diencephalon, which can only be seen internally, and is comprised of structures such as the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And then finally, we have the cerebrum, and this makes up the majority or mass of volume of the brain. And it's comprised of the cortex, that outer folded area, and then that inner folded area. Now, a lot of these structures show bilateral symmetry. So that's there's like a mirror image left and right portion of those structures, such as with the thalamus, for example. When we look at the basic organization of the central nervous system, we'll see some consistent patterns throughout all the different sections. So for example, throughout all the sections, cere cerebellum, brainstem, spinal cord, we see 
that there is a central cavity surrounded by gray matter. Now that central cavity is actually filled with cerebral spinal fluid. It's not just hollow. So this is going to offer some protection for those structures. And surrounding that, you can see that there is a darker ring of what we call gray matter. Okay. What do you think um, that gray matter consists of? Do you think it would more likely to be cell bodies of neurons or axons? That's right. They're going to be cell bodies, so they're darker. Um, and so these are the computational centers of the brain. And you'll see following that now, these are surrounded by an outer layer of white matter. Now, these are white due to myelin along the length of the axon. So these you can think of as kind of the information highways where we're transporting information to the gray matter areas, the gray matter areas. And then finally, you can see on that upper portion here, the region of the cerebellum, we see a cortex of gray matter, an additional area of gray matter. And this is going to be where higher level thinking is done within the CNS. If we look at another cross section of the brain here, we can see up in the top left, you can see that uh, pattern of gray matter to white matter to gray matter. Um, so starting with the cortex, we can see it is made up of gray matter. And then we'll move to the inner white matter, the axons of those neurons. You can also see the corpus callosum. That is white matter that collects, I'm sorry, connects the two hemispheres of the brain together. That's where they're actually physically connected. Um, information travels back and forth between those hemispheres via the corpus callosum. And then we'll see deep to that, then we have cerebral nuclei. So we're moving down. And this is another clustering of gray matter. So it's a cluster of cell bodies. And we call them nuclei within the CNS. This isn't like nuclei of a cell. Um, also note that a clustering of bodies within the peripheral nervous system, remember, that's called ganglia. Now we're in the CNS. We call these nuclei. And we'll talk about them within the following lecture. And then on the right, we just have a better depiction of gray versus white matter. So you can see within the gray matter, we have the neuronal cell bodies, the dendrites, and then when we transition to white matter, we have the axons, which the myelin sheath gives us that white appearance. We'll now transition to CNS protection. How do we protect the central nervous system, including the brain and spinal cord? And we'll begin with the protective layers, the meninges. Now, the brain needs protection because the complex, delicate structures that make up the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, they're susceptible to various types of injury. And these range from trauma to neurodegenerative diseases. So Alzheimer's, for example, or MS, multiple sclerosis, that we talked about last time. Now, unfortunately, because of the complexity of the brain and the spinal cord, there's actually little repair or healing that occurs. So brain damage or paralysis from spinal cord injury, they're often permanent and incapacitating. So we have these features here to protect the CNS from injury, um, starting with basic skull and vertebral column, so the cranium. We can see this layer of bone there um, under the skin on the skull. Then we have those three cranial meninges, protective layers. And then we have cerebral spinal fluid. So within the starting here, we can see the ventricles, which are filled with CSF. And then finally, the blood-brain barrier. The cranial meninges consist of three connective tissue layers, and they act to separate and support the soft tissue of the brain. They also enclose and protect the different blood vessels that supply the brain, and they also help contain and circulate the CSF. So as we move from deep to superficial, the deepest layer is the pia mater, then we move to the arachnoid mater, and then on top of that, we have the dura mater. Now we just said that one of the roles of the meninges is to separate and support soft tissues of the brain. And one clear example of that is the two hemispheres of the brain being separated by meninges. So here we can see um, running longitudinally here through the center of this brain, through the center, uh, hemispheres here, we have the falx cerebri. It's called the cerebral falx. Um, and it, it has this sickle-like form, and it's this large 
crescent or sickle shaped fold of the meningeal layer of the dura mater. Okay. So that descends vertically into that longitudinal fissure that separates the two hemispheres um, and adds additional protection between the two hemispheres. Now the meninges are wrapping the entire CNS. So they continue within the spinal cord. So we can see those three layers here, again, going from the deepest, the pia mater, to the outermost, the dura mater. The innermost layer of the cranial meninges is the pia mater, and it adheres directly to the surface of the brain. It's comprised of a thin layer of areolar connective tissue and actually probably gives rise to its name pia mater, which translates to tender mother. Next, um, external to the pia mater, we have the arachnoid mater. Okay? And we can see that directly beneath that, extending to the pia mater, we have what is called arachnoid trabeculae. So trabeculae are kind of like these connective tissues that form these columnist-like structures, so really prominent in bone as well. Um, it's made of collagen and elastic fibers, and it creates this web-like appearance, hence arachnoid matter, right? Everyone loved that last year, so I left it in. Um, and it's that subarachnoid space there associated with the arachnoid mater that contains cerebrospinal fluid. So that area with the trabeculae creates this hollow space that fills up with CSF. And that lies deep to the dura mater, our final layer. And finally, we have the dura mater. Dura meaning hard or tough. So we had the inner layer, the uh, tender mother, but now we have the tough mother with that translation. So got something like this. I don't know about you, but I had a tough mom growing up, so I can totally relate. Uh, so the dura mater forms this tough outer membrane, which is why it's named so, and it's made of dense irregular connective tissue. Uh, it usually actually consists of two layers, but these are often fused. Um, so these layers are fused, but in some areas they separate those two layers to give kind of a cavity, and that's what forms the dural venous sinuses, and this helps draining excess CSF from the brain. And we'll actually look at that in a little bit when we focus more on CSF later within this lecture. Here's a look at this tough connective tissue layer, the dura mater, on an actual cadaver. Today I want to talk about how your brain has two helmets. You have a hard helmet and a soft helmet. The hard helmet is exactly what you think it is, and it's the skull. And if we look on the inside, you can see where it almost looks like rivers have carved into stone. This is from the meningeal arteries pulsating, and it kind of the bone forms around it. Now, the soft helmet is this thing. This is called the dura mater, or mater, and it's a meninge that surrounds your brain. So you could think of it as a soft tissue helmet. And actually, shortly after recording this lecture, uh, I had a little incident on my mountain bike. I was going really fast on a trail and kind of bounced off the edge and hit a tree. Uh, thankfully, I had my two anatomical helmets to protect me. We had my skull and then the cranial meninges, including that dura mater la uh, layer that was just discussed. And then thankfully, I also had my third actual bike helmet. Um, so don't rely completely on your anatomy. You want to save your brain. Here we can see them all put together now, the three layers, starting with that innermost layer, the pia mater, which adheres directly to the surface of the brain. And then above that, we have the arachnoid matter. And you can see that arachnoid space and those arachnoid uh, trabeculae in between the pia mater there and that arachnoid mater. And then atop that, we have our dura mater, to which we said is comprised of two layers. Um, generally, they're so close together, though, it looks like one. But we do have those instances where it separates to give rise to the dural venous sinus, which is that bluish area in the middle there where you can see that arachnoid villus projecting into that dural space. We will talk about that very shortly. Moving on now to talk about the ventricles within the brain. You have hollow spaces inside of your brain. You see this right here? This is called the lateral ventricle. 
And then this triangular shaped portion here is called the fourth ventricle. Now normally inside of there would be filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And that fluid is created in these spaces. Eventually it leaves these spaces and then bathes and surrounds the brain and your whole brain is then floating inside of your skull. You have hollow spaces inside of your brain. You see this right here? This is called the lateral ventricle. And then this triangular shaped portion here is called the fourth ventricle. Now normally inside of there would be filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And that fluid is created in these spaces. Eventually it leaves these spaces and then bathes and surrounds the brain and your whole brain is then floating inside of your skull. So essentially, that cerebrospinal fluid that's made within those ventricles creates this type of uh, protective helmet for your brain. The ventricles then are cavities within the brain that we just learned are not hollow but contain CSF. There are certain areas that are lined with ependymal cells that create that CSF. And when it's made, they're all those ventricles are connected with one another so the CSF can flow through them. It can enter the spinal cord via the central canal, and it also enters in the bottom of that last ventricle, the fourth ventricle, there's a little space where it can enter into the subarachnoid space, and that way we can fill those meningeal layers with CSF. There are four ventricles within the brain. There are two lateral ventricles. So these would be ventricles one and two, but they're named the lateral ventricles. And then we have the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. The two lateral ventricles, named so because of their position um, within the brain there, they're the largest cavities within the cerebrum. And remember within these ventricles, we are making CSF within a specific region. So um, the third ventricle, that's just a narrow space within the middle of the diencephalon, you can see there. And then there is the fourth ventricle. And the fourth ventricle is important because it opens to the subarachnoid space. So you can imagine, let's say some CSF is being made within the lateral ventricle. It's going to move into the third ventricle where a little more is made. And then it's going to move into the fourth ventricle. And then that CSF can actually enter into the subarachnoid layer of the meninges to give us that kind of floating protective helmet. Now, a good way to remember this, um, Jen actually taught me this one, is that this kind of looks like a dragon. Okay, So there's where you're... Uh, CSF is going to enter into the subarachnoid space and then we can superimpose this dragon-like figure on top of it, right? So you can imagine the lateral ventricles kind of look like wings, the third ventricle is going to make the body of that dragon, while the fourth ventricle is going to make the tail. So when you're learning this anatomy, that did help me. These protective measures of the CNS do a pretty good job, but they're not always adequate. So let's see what's happened if they are overcome. Let's talk about a concussion. You see, your brain is floating inside of your skull and there's a fluid barrier between the brain and your skull. But if you hit your head hard enough, you can overcome that fluid barrier and get a concussion. It could happen here in the temporal lobe, it could happen in the frontal lobe in front, or if you get hit in a rotational movement, say like a fighter gets punched in the face, you can agitate and aggravate this area in here called the diencephalon. Now concussions come with a bunch of different symptoms including vomiting, anger, confusion, and loss of balance. So since we talked about ventricles now we should talk about the cerebrospinal fluid that is made within a certain area of those ventricles. Cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, is a clear colorless liquid that surrounds the central nervous system. Um, it circulates within the ventricles and is made within there, we just learned, and within that subarachnoid space, the layers of the meninges. And the functions are to provide buoyancy. So how much do you think your brain weighs on average? It actually weighs around three pounds, so that's quite a bit to carry atop your shoulders. Um, and you can imagine, if you didn't have some type of buoyancy in there, and every time you just twisted your head rapidly, your brain would bash against your skull, uh, and that wouldn't be good. So CSF reduces the brain's weight by about 95%. In fact, CSF has the same density as the brain itself, so your brain's actually just kind of suspended within that fluid. 
so it creates a protective layer, provides a liquid cushion. Not only does CSF act as a shock absorber, but it also has a role in exchange of materials with neurons. Now neurons and glial cells, they're only in contact with interstitial fluid within the brain there. And there's more free exchange that occurs between cerebral spinal fluid and that interstitial fluid than even there is with blood. So the composition of that CSF is important because we gotta get things out like uh, metabolic waste as well as nutrients into those cells via the interstitial fluid. As we learned in the last lecture, it's the ependymal cells that line the cavities in the brain and the spinal cord. Um, they're ciliated simple columnar, and remember that cilia atop those columnar cells helps move along the CSF that is made. And these help produce and move cerebral spinal fluid. So it surrounds and protects the CNF, bays the brain and spine in nutrients, and eliminates waste products. Now the CSF that is formed by those ependymal cells is actually formed by the concentration of those ependymal cells within what we call choroid plexus. And they're found within each ventricle. And we'll look at those on the next slide, the specific locations. So there's a layer of ependymal cells and blood capillaries that exist within the choroid plexus. Blood is filtered through the capillary and modified then by the ependymal cells. So the composition of the CSF is pretty similar to blood. Um, there are some differences. The CSF is lower in potassium, slightly higher in sodium. Um, but in addition, the ependymal cell secretions and interstitial fluid then fill the subarachnoid space. So we've created that floating protective layer there for the brain within the meninges. So here we can see, I'll point out the different choroid plexus of the ventricles. So here we have the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle, choroid plexus of the third ventricle, and then finally the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. So this is where we have the concentration of capillaries as well as those ependymal cells. Well, we will form the CSF that's going to flow through those ventricles. And then you can take a look here at this diagram. You can see the flow of CSF if you follow these uh, numerals here and it enters to that subarachnoid space where it can then cushion the brain. I should also point out that CSF is continually being formed and reabsorbed. So I just mentioned that CSF is... Cerebral edema is when there's swelling inside the cells of the brain or around the cells of the brain. Now remember, this is a closed system. So your brain is surrounded in this dura mater, and then you even have the skull on top of that. So there's nowhere for the brain to go as it swells. So you can start picturing those cells inside of the brain start pushing on one another, start pushing on the meninges, the skull. It can even start pushing on the nerves that are branching off of it. Now, you can get cerebral edema from altitude sickness. You can get it from a stroke and you can even get it from a reaction to a medication. How then do we prevent the accumulation of CSF so that we do not um, have cerebral edema? Well, we need some way to get rid of excess CSF. And what occurs is that excess CSF is going to flow into what we call arachnoid villi. So kind of protruding from that subarachnoid space, um, we have a villus that appears. And that helps drain excess CSF into the dural venous sinuses. Now I'm going to show you exactly how that works on the next slide. So first you got the brain here, All right, so I'll just do kind of those convolutions, the gyri of the brain. And then atop that we'll have our first layer, the pia mater. Okay. So we'll put the pia mater directly atop the, remember it here is directly to the surface of the brain. Okay. And then above that then, we are going to have um, our arachnoid layer of the meninges. 
And associated with that, we have this little arachnoid villus that projects up into the dural sinus. Okay. So beneath that, we're going to have a subarachnoid space with those trabeculi in there, just collagen and elastin. Okay. And this is where, remember, our CSF flows. Okay. So some of that CSF is going to enter up into this arachnoid villus. Okay. But then we have our last layer that we need to draw. And that is the dura mater. And remember the dura mater is actually two separate layers. So while they're normally together, when we get to this uh, villus here, they actually will split to give rise to that dural sinus. Okay. So this is that dural sinus here. That says sinus, apology, my tablet hasn't arrived yet. So that excess CSF is going to be pushed here through this um, arachnoid villus, and it's going to enter the dural sinus, where it gets a chance to return to venous uh, blood supply. And that's it. And then finally, the last bit of CNS protection, let's talk about the blood-brain barrier, or as I'll simplify it for it throughout lecture, the BBB. And we did talk about the blood-brain barrier a little bit in the last lecture, just its association with the astrocytes. So let me say a little bit more. Um, recap, it helps protect the brain from harmful things that may be in the blood, and it's very selective. So how is it selective? Well, the walls of brain capillaries, the endothelial cells, they're joined by tight junctions. So if you think about your different cell-to-cell -cell adhesions, Tight junctions are the ones that do not allow things to pass in between the cells. They're actually physically kind of sewn together via these KISS sites um, where strand proteins physically attach the cells. Um, and it prevents movement of things between the cells then, which is not common with other endothelial cells. Things can generally kind of squeeze in between endothelial cells. Not in this case. Um, so the exchange that occurs has to go through the cells. Because things are going through the cells, lipid-soluble things, are okay. They can generally pass through there with no problem. Things such as oxygen, CO2. Um, the things that are not lipid soluble but we will need within that uh, CSF or that interstitial fluid that bathes the brain, um, we're going to need membrane bound carriers. Uh, this allows things like glucose and amino acids to um, enter the cell. So transport across the walls is either prevented, as it is with these um, tight junctions, or it's restricted. We need some type of membrane-bound carrier specific to that molecule. And just to recap on those astrocytes, so we said astrocytes, uh, they weren't quite sure on the role of the astrocytes, but they do help the endothelial walls to form those tight junctions. New research has shown that. So when those endothelial walls are developing, the astrocytes help them form tight junctions, which is again irregular. Usually they're not tight junctions associated with the endothelial walls. All right, and then we will finish up today just with a little brief overview of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is a long slender cylinder of nerve. Um, it extends from the brainstem down to in between your uh, first and second lumbar vertebrae. It's about 45 centimeters long, that's about 18 inches, and 2 centimeters in diameter, that's about 3 quarters of an inch. So it extends through the vertebral canal and is connected to these spinal nerves that uh, come out in pairs. So paired spinal nerves emerge from the cord. Um, they, they project through spaces from the wing-like bony structure of the vertebrae. And they're named according to the region from which they project. So you can see on the left there we have like C1, C2. So those could be cervical paired uh, nerves there. Now you still have the meninges. Uh, they're just the spinal meninges now, those three protective layers we talked about. And it's actually, if you guys have heard of an epidural that is given to uh, mothers during pregnancy, cuts down on pain. It's a local, it's a cocktail of anesthetics es essentially. And it's called an epidural because it's injected into the epidural space. So remember, you have two layers of that dura mater. It's actually injected between there in that epidural space to ease delivery.
Now, I mentioned that your spinal cord only goes down to between your first and second lumbar vertebrae. But you'll see, looking at that previous image, that you have these nerves that continue to move down into sacral regions uh, beneath that. So what's going on there? Well, this is called the cauda echina. So let's take a look. I want to show you one of the most incredible things in the human body. You see this? This is the spinal cord, and it's traveling down your back, and it's being protected by bone. You see, these are the vertebrae. And it's traveling through a tunnel, which we can see right here. This is called the vertebral foramen. And as it travels down the back, you can see it kind of being protected here. All of a sudden, when it gets to your low back, it turns into something different. You see this? This is called the cauda equina, and it literally means horse tail. Your spinal cord, once it reaches the I want to show you one of the most incredible things in the human body. You see this? This is the spinal cord, and it's traveling down your back, and it's being protected by bone. You see, these are the vertebrae. I want to show you one of the most incredible things in the human body. You see this? This is the spinal cord, and it's traveling down your back, and it's being protected by bone. You see, these are the vertebrae. And it's traveling through a tunnel, which we can see right here. This is called the vertebral foramen. And as it travels down the back, you can see it kind of being protected here. All of a sudden, when it gets to your low back, it turns into something different. You see this? This is called the cauda equina, and it literally means horse tail. Your spinal cord, once it reaches the low back, just branches out into a bunch of nerves. So just like with the brain, we see here that with the spinal column, we have alternating layers of white matter and gray matter. So I'll just put a box around this one we can focus on here, just one of these thoracic cross sections of the spinal cord. Um, you'll see in the very center, that is our central canal, and that's going to be filled with the cerebral spinal fluid. And then surrounding that, we have kind of that pattern, butterfly pattern of gray matter. Now the gray matter again, that's the uh, cell bodies, neuronal cell bodies, and it kind of forms this pattern of like a butterfly, okay? So we can say they have posterior and anterior here. You'll also see in your book it's referred to as dorsal and ventral. So you have these dorsal horns or these ventral horns or these posterior horns, anterior horns. We can think of those kind of as the butterfly's wings. Uh, surrounding that, we have white matter. And that's organized into tracks. So these are long axes and fibers that are running up and down either to the CNS um, from the periphery or from the CNS out to the periphery. Those tracks. And they're bundles of nerves with um, a similar function. So you have ascending tracks, descending tracks. Okay. Nerve endings. The different horns, dorsal, lateral, or ventral, they're going to house different cell bodies, neuron cell bodies. So for example, if we look at the top here, the dorsal horn, that's going to contain the cell bodies of interneurons on which afferent neurons terminate. So we have an afferent neuron here shown in blue. Remember, afferent arrives, so that's going to be incoming information. So that's going to synapse with an interneuron within that dorsal horn. Uh, next up, we have the lateral horn. And this has cell bodies of the autonomic efferent nerve fibers. So efferent exits, and that's going to be part of the autonomic, things that happen automatically in the body. And then ventral, these are going to be cell bodies of somatic efferent neurons. And remember, those synapse with skeletal muscle. So both lateral and ventral horn are associated with outgoing information from the CNS. So the takeaway for today, we know that neurons can't divide to replace damaged cells, but protective devices are in place to shelter the brain. So there's three layers of protective membranes. We talked about the three different meninges. There's the CSF that flows within and around the brain to cushion against jarring. And then finally, we talked about protection from chemical injury that is provided by the blood-brain barrier, which helps limit the uh, brain from blood-borne substances. That look very similar to a horse tail. In my eyes, this is one of the coolest things in the human body.